Please welcome Dr. Sanaz Masumi. Good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed lunch and networking and catching up with your colleagues and friends. Uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, who is a venture capital investor and an acclaimed recording artist who Fast Company named one of the 100 most creative people in business. While an undergraduate at Harvard, he studied with Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. and received the Andrew Rampard and Elaine Locke prizes as the top graduate in his department. Prior to leaving school, Farrell Williams discovered his band, Chester French, and signed a group to Interscope Records, where they released two full-length albums. Since 2011, he has focused on investing and has built a parallel career as a venture capitalist, backing a series of industry-defining technology companies, including Spotify, SpaceX, Ripple, The Boring Company, and Memphis Meets. Since 2015, he has focused on biotechnology and healthcare, seeking to reinvent medicine through breakthrough startups like Beam, Glimpse, Doctor on Demand, Devoted Health, and Neuralink. He's the co-founder of the nonprofit Franco Fund for Preventive Genomics, an advisory board member of No Patient Left Behind, and a member of the board of trustees of the Santa Fe Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome DA Wallace to the stage. Please welcome DA Wallace. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm DA. And uh, as you can probably guess from Sanaz's incredibly generous introduction, uh, I never expected to be speaking at this sort of event. And my being here is really the result of two surprises in my life. One of those uh, has been quite welcome. And that she alluded to as well, which is that about a decade ago, I hung up my microphone as a singer and started investing as a hobby in startup technology companies and found that I had an amazing time doing this and a real passion for helping great entrepreneurs bring their ideas into the economy. Uh, the second surprise was uh, much less welcome and came in the form of my wife's death four years ago uh, on the day after she delivered our first child. And that was, of course, a uh, life redefining moment for me. And it also uh, invited me into this world that you all are a part of and gave me an awareness that in addition to the frontier that I chase as an investor trying to push the technology of medicine forward, there is this whole other frontier that has to do with harm reduction. And I wanna string those together and think of them as part of one long trajectory in the history of medicine. And I would characterize that trajectory very simply as an evolution from witchcraft to what will hopefully one day become a true science. And I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're getting closer every day. And it's a very old story. So, I want to take you through a bit of this history. Let's see if I can get the slides to go. Um, without being too cute about it, I want to assert that medicine has always had as a significant part of its history a component of witchcraft and BS. And it goes back to the very beginning. Uh, we'll talk about these characters here uh, in a little bit, but I, I thought they were sort of remarkable illustrations. These are from the Middle Ages, 14th, 15th, and 16th century physicians. And um, I want to quote a great medical historian, Henry Sigarist, who noted that some physicians endeavored to outdo themselves by dressing extravagantly and by displaying showy instruments. He also said it was highly probable that the art of prognostication in the first instance arose as a way of trying to define oneself as a physician as somehow distinguished from the other quacks that were running around peddling whatever they were selling. And so if we go back to the very beginning in antiquity, uh, 
medicine was essentially a free-for-all. Anybody could claim to be a physician, and they did. And that history of witchcraft, unfortunately, has lived much longer. So this depicts a lobotomy. And amazingly, we were still doing this to people that today would be called treatment-resistant depression patients well into the 20th century. And unfortunately, it's still going strong. Uh, I could have picked any number of examples, but this is just a website I pulled up. I, I didn't know this existed. There is an entire cottage industry of people who will sell your loved ones on the idea that they should pay thousands of dollars to be heated up to cure their cancer, despite the fact that there's no evidence that this works. And so you can think about industries like this that are still proliferating, often run by physicians. So again, back to antiquity, I just want to reframe sort of how this all got started. Uh, again, anyone could claim to be a physician, and there were, even from those early days in Greco-Roman times, some efforts to try and set apart those who were true doctors. So certain Roman emperors, in fact, even designated 10 or 15 physicians, or so-called physicians, in each city as the real doctors. And that was kind of the start of the guild mentality because they didn't have to pay taxes. So, of course, who wouldn't want to be a doctor if you didn't have to pay taxes? And uh, I think it's worth mentioning also that despite the mention in the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm, the Hippocratic Oath was really an oath of fealty to your uh, instructor. Quoting from the original or the, the oldest standing version of the Hippocratic Oath, I will hold my teacher in this art equal to my own parents, to make him partner in my livelihood, when he is in need of money, to share mine with him, to consider his family as my own brothers, and to teach them this art, if they want to learn it, without fee or indenture. It's very romantic. And it wasn't really, I'm going to go back here, it wasn't really until medieval times that you started to have a formalization of medical licensure. So, this was really an outgrowth of the other professional guilds, particularly in the UK, but across Europe. And again, quoting from Sigurus, the idea of licensing the medical profession resulted from the general structure of medieval society, which was strictly organized according to status, crafts, trades, and professions. Each such vocational group had regulations, standard setting codes, guaranteeing highly qualified services to society. It was recognized that such standards were particularly important in the case of the medical profession, because in no other profession is lack of knowledge so serious in its consequences as in medicine. So you could think of these medieval guilds as akin to labor unions for different trades. And in fact, in towns and villages where there weren't a sufficient number of doctors, they were frequently joining the blacksmith guild, just to have some group to represent them in terms of laws and, uh, and the quality of their work experience. And it was in 1518 here that Henry VIII is noted to have set up the uh, Royal Society, Royal College of Physicians in London. And that was viewed by many as the first true national society of physicians that in a certain sense regulated their adherence to medical best practices and knowledge. So there's been this counter movement batting back the BS and witchcraft that really started to accelerate in medieval times. That became very commonplace through those centuries. And then shifting to America, it really grew up in the 19th and 20th centuries. And that was when we started to see some of the organizations that today are quite robust that govern medical education and the accreditation of physicians. Now, of course, we still do this in a somewhat fragmented manner there is both the judgment of physicians at the university level and then with board exams, but there has been effort to standardize these nationally um, and in some minor areas to standardize things internationally. Now, in parallel to this history of self-regulation by physicians of what is taught and what is supposed to be practiced, there is a parallel history of medical negligence. And in the legal domain, the question has essentially been, what should the recourse be if physicians practice something that is not the standard of care? And how should we hold them accountable 
to do so. And when you look into this history, it's, it's very interesting. There are a series of court cases in the US that have progressively defined what it should be. What is considered maybe the most significant is Helling versus Carey, a 1974 case in which the plaintiff Helling sued her ophthalmologist Carey for the loss of her eyesight due to glaucoma. And she asserted that failure to perform a relatively cheap test could have prevented this. And her treating physician argued that that test was by no means standard. And this really set the physician community on fire because the judge ruled that it was not merely the customary practice of other physicians that should dictate what the physician should have done here. That had been sort of the standard till that point. And quoting uh, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, in a 1903 case, uh, the, the judge ruling in Kerry said that what is usually done may be evidence of what ought to be done, but what ought to be done is fixed by a standard of reasonable prudence, whether it usually is complied with or not. So here's this idea that whether physicians in general do something, if there is evidence supporting it, it should be done. And the backlash against this was a series of state legislative actions around our country to try and reclaim at the state level the definition of negligence and malpractice and to say, no, it is defined by local practice. In other words, whatever the evidence says, if doctors here in Orange County do something, it doesn't matter what doctors in New York or London do. All that matters is what a reasonably judicious physician in this community have done what was done. And so this, I think, can be framed in, in the following way. Imagine you have this sort of normal distribution of evidence-based medical practice. The question is, where do we set the bar? And if you envision any of these vertical lines as the cutoff, we have to ask, is it malpractice only if you deliver something below the minimal standard or is it malpractice if you deliver something that is below the community standard or sort of the average? And of course, a lot of physicians would argue that even the community standard is too stringent because if we're saying that everything below the average is malpractice, that would mean half of all medical care is malpractice. And that obviously seems illogical and untenable. But I wanna make the argument that with the technology we have before us today, it is actually possible for us to set the highest conceivable bar, which is world-class gold standard evidence-based care, and that that should be the standard. Anything other than that should in fact be viewed as malpractice. Sanaz so mentioned that one of my first investments was Spotify. And what we did with that company that I think has changed the world in a wonderful way was to take this fragmented distribution system that existed for music. You'll remember Sam Goody and Tower Records, essentially the equivalent of large integrated health systems, big buildings full of records. The equivalent of doctors were essentially the record store clerks who had encyclopedic memories of musical history and could recommend you the perfect record. And we blew that up and centralized everything that had ever been done in recorded music and put it in one database in the cloud that could be accessible by everyone wherever they were in the world. And I think we need to do the same thing in medicine. I call it streaming medicine. And what it really means is world-class medicine, that highest bar possible for the entire world. So it's a deceptively simple idea. It might be so simple that it's dumb, but it might be brilliant. I hope it's brilliant. And the idea is that we actually need to take today, which is a very fragmented standard of care, and we need to centralize it into a single evidence-based corpus of medical knowledge, best practices, medical reasoning in the form of AIs, personalization to patients based on idiosyncratic biomarkers. It needs to be always up to date and it needs to be the same everywhere in the world. There should not be different standards in cities. There shouldn't be different standards in countries. Every person on earth deserves to benefit from the same best possible medical knowledge that we can bring them. Uh, thank you. Sounds like you thought it was brilliant. Um, there are, I think, three major barriers to this, and I'm gonna run through them really quickly. The first is fragmentation. 
And I just want to make the point that while we talk about this thing, the standard of care, as if it exists, it doesn't. Where is the standard of care? Show me the book that compiles the standard of care into one place. Instead, what we have are a million fragmentary standards of care. Everyone has their own standard of care. Physician societies, individual practitioners, insurance companies, the federal government, different governments. And I think, despite how difficult it will be to do, the world's private and public sectors need to come together to unify this knowledge into a single consensus body of knowledge. The second is medical culture, which still stands in the way of doing this in at least two major dimensions. One is this long-standing tension between the so-called art and science of medicine. And as an artist, I want to just say that I think it's terrifying to think of medicine as an art. Uh, that's not to say that there shouldn't be physician judgment. It's not to say that there isn't a lot of room for creativity or detailed reasoning but it should be the furthest thing from an art. It should become a real science. And paternalism is a modality culturally that needs to end. And um, I'll even be so crazy in a room full of doctors as to suggest that we should get rid of the honorific title doctor. We don't call lawyers Esquire anymore. This is a power standard. It's a cultural practice that is meant to create a distinction between those who have the power and those who don't, namely the patients, and I think we should get rid of it. And finally, this is an optimistic note, technology has been a barrier to this unified global standard of care, but it is not anymore. We now have the computational means to do real-time distribution of medical knowledge. We are quickly getting AI co-pilots that are gonna blow everybody away in terms of their ability to assist with making medical judgments and processing information in real time. And finally, auditing that delivery of care is something that we're gonna be able to do in real time with very high fidelity. Uh, I won't go through this because I wanna wrap up, but here's my blueprint and anyone who wants to please email me and I'll send you this and we can talk about it. I'm da at timebioventures.com. I just wanna end on a couple, again, optimistic points. The first is that I believe that streaming medicine is actually gonna redefine the entire medical labor force. I do think we should get rid of the title doctor. I don't know that we should get rid of doctors as such, but I think the labor roles are gonna look completely different in 10 or 15 years. And basically the question is, how can we lower the technical barrier to entry for the practice of medicine, which might ironically sound like it's gonna make care more dangerous, but is actually the only way that we can get enough labor into this workforce to democratize high quality care and extend it to everybody. And I think a, a more distributed labor force plus streaming medicine can be much better than even the most thoughtful doctors like House. And finally, I think this is a moral imperative because we don't have an ability to produce enough physicians in the traditional sense to create the density of them everywhere in the world where people deserve high quality care. So I'm gonna leave you with these four thoughts. The first, medicine still on this journey from witchcraft to science. And we need to finally wrap up that journey and turn it into a real science. Second, the corpus of medical knowledge is one of the great achievements of human civilization. Uh, I think, uh, I forget which physicist had the gold record, but the idea was we're gonna send out a gold record. Uh, Carl Sagan wanted to send a gold record into space and did in fact. And the question was, it was sort of like a time capsule. What are we gonna put on the gold record that represents humanity's greatest knowledge and achievements? Well, imagine tomorrow an asteroid hit us and every physician in medical school dropped off the face of the earth. The question is, what would we put on that gold record that encompasses everything we've learned in these several thousand years about human biology and disease? And that's what we need to make computable and put into streaming medicine. Third, as we talk about this AI revolution, this streaming medicine corpus is the substrate that it needs. And finally, uh, and I think it's very germane to this group, I believe this is gonna finally deliver the safety that we all aspire to. By enabling us to audit in real time everything that is done in the practice of medicine and ensure that it is consistent with the best of human knowledge, we will be able to eviscerate harm to patients insofar as it's possible. Thanks for listening and appreciate your time.